football doesn't mean anything to me. Like we're just trying to win games out here, and so I don't know who's hot, who's not, who wins, who doesn't. Like I don't really care about that. I just care about whether we win. So yeah, I have fun with that. Bill Belichick, Patriots head coach, does not care about the fantasy team. We have someone here who deeply cares yeah. about all fantasy teams, especially his, Matthew Barry. Welcome. And let me just say this. Yeah. Let me say this. I'm at an age where I know all the people that I want to know. Okay? <laughs> okay, fair. I'm not looking for new friends. Yeah. You know, Jerry Seinfeld has a bit about that. When you're an adult, you got your three or four friends, and that's it. Matt Casey knows this very well. Right. I am not interested in knowing anyone else. I know all the people that I choose to know. However, I will say that it has been a tremendous delight to get to know you over the past couple of days. I am thrilled that Matthew Berry is now part of the NBC Sports family. So I am making an exception to right. my usual approach. I have a new friend in I Matthew will take Berry. That, brother. All right. I will all take right. that. Thank so. you very much. No, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I don't. I don't like any. You know, it's like right. You have your. You have your friends. Like, listen. I have. I have adults that I have to deal with because I have kids. So I have to deal with their their parents. And then you've got you've got neighbors. And you've got your actual friends. So I, I'm uh, I'm with you. And I'm flattered. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled to be part of the NBC Sports family. Everyone has been so welcoming and great. You know, it's a scary transition because I was I was at ESPN for 15 years, and to come, you, you know, you never know what to expect. Like I was. You know, for the first time in a long time, new kid at school, and everyone's been nothing short of amazing. Yeah, I mean, I went through this 13 years ago when I joined NBC, and you do the same thing, like, what is this going to be? How is this going to be? And everyone has always been great. I mean, for 13 years, it's been great. So I'm thrilled you're here, and uh, it's been great so far, and I look forward to working with you. Yeah, same. Indefinitely. I, yes, I appreciate that. Yeah, listen, <laughs> yeah, I, I sure hope so, because you, you leave something for 15 years. You hope uh, you're not just doing it for... Uh, right for a quick stop here. So I'm really excited. It's a homecoming for me. I started my career at Roto World, obviously NBC Sports. And so I, it's rare that somebody gets a chance to come full circle. And, uh, you know, I feel like I did. So I, I was home. telling you last night that yeah. that's how we kind of first got on the NBC radar screen because we did some work with Roto World and we yeah, would sell right. the draft guides and they would sell incredibly well. And that caught the eye of Rick Cordella, who became – responsible for NBCSports.com, and then everything just kind of fell in place from there. When my very first job at uh, NBC at Roto World was 1999, and I uh, I got a job writing for free, writing a, a fantasy football column for free in 1999, and I think Rick Cordella joined that exact same week, writing player blur blurbs, like maybe for 50 bucks a week. Like you know, him and I both basically joined the same week rotoworld.com and so yeah i mean so rick and i have been friends for 20 years it's funny because it was 2000 a year later that i started writing for the old nfltalk.com website if you remember that yeah sure for free yeah yeah, right? yeah. just for free it's like what the hell what else am i doing it it's a, a hobby passion. right yeah because any other this is the conversation i had with my wife at the time because she's like why are you doing all this stuff and you're not getting paid for it it's like well if I wasn't doing this, I would be doing something that actually cost me money. So at right. least we're ahead of the game. Right, I right, could go exactly. golf and yeah. spend 50 bucks and be gone for six hours and be pissed off when I get home. Or I could do this and it makes me happy. And who cares if they're not paying me? Yeah. Now, now that no longer applies, by right. the way. The event that anyone, yeah, Rick Cordella, like yeah, if you're yeah. watching, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mike <laughs> but, and I both have kids. We, yeah. we need a paycheck. But, but uh, what, what caused you to even trip into this world how did that get so i'm always fascinated by that that origin story how did how did you end up doing this uh <clears throat> so uh nerdy kid candidly i mean just i was 14 years old and so i and i was 14 years old in 1984 just to date myself and uh do you remember, there was a book called rotisserie league baseball do you remember the phrase rotisserie league baseball? It was the name of the restaurant in philadelphia the, uh new york but new yes york. yeah la rotisserie yes. like the people that invented the game would have lunch every week uh, at a restaurant now, La Rotisserie Francaise, which had, it's now defunct, but it was in uh, in New York, and they were all literary types, you know, writers of Esquire and, and the New York Times and columnists. And so they wrote this book, uh, uh, Daniel Okrent and Glenn Wagoner, and they wrote this great book called Rotisserie League Baseball, the greatest game for baseball fans since baseball. And it was basically about fantasy baseball. And so uh, in 1984, that was the first spring after that book came out, there was a league forming and like I was a, actually a pretty good tennis player as a kid and 
I was walking up to my lens. I, I was taking pro, uh, you know, pro lessons. And I hear my coach talking about in this weird language with a buddy of his. I'm like, you guys talk about rotisserie league baseball? And they're like, you've heard of it? And I'm like, yeah, you guys had? Because it was just in a book. And I was just, I read every sports book I could back then. And they needed another member. So at 14 years old, I joined my first rotisserie league baseball uh, league. I have since, in the years past, I've gotten to actually meet Daniel Okrent, the inventor of the game, and and do a fantasy baseball draft with him. And he, we were one of the first 50 leagues in America. And uh, I've been playing ever since. And so, uh, 1999, I fast forward to 99. Quick question. Yes, sir. 84, your first team. Your first team, who was on it? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, my very first player that I ever got was Mario Soto. Nobody cares. You know, I know. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well done. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Shout out to Pardon My Take. That's right. Right. Exactly. Um, and Bill Belichick certainly doesn't care. Yes. Um, we can tell by the way he uses his running backs. He does not care about fantasy managers. So anyway, 1999, I'm living in Hollywood as a screenwriter uh, for movies and TV. And Roto World, which I'm on all the, so all the time, is advertising for writers. This is 1999. This is the days of AOL and CompuServe. You had to dial up, like, yes. you've got mail. That was a novel thing. Like, oh, I've got an email. That's exciting. Like, people didn't know. So at any rate, I email them in, and I say, hey, listen, I'm a, uh, I'm a huge fantasy player. It's my passion. I love it. I'm a professional writer living out here in Hollywood, and I think, you know, it would be so much fun just to write a column on the side for you. Could I try it? Could I send you a sample? And so uh, the legendary Matthew Pouliot, who still works at Roto World today, does all the baseball coverage for us, writes me back and says, Married with Children is my favorite show of all time. I, I looked you up on IMDb. Married with Children is my favorite show of all time. You're hired. So because I wrote for Married with Children, I got a chance to write a free column for Roto World around fantasy baseball, and the column sort of took off. And eventually they started paying me and uh, just kept going and going. And then in... Uh, 2004, I felt like I'd developed enough of a following that I could start my own website. People were starting to make money on the internet. So I left Roto World to start TalentedMrRoto.com, made a deal with Roto World where they would run my columns and just link back to my site. Um, and so I did that for a couple of years, started promoting the site in a bunch of places, one of which was ESPN. And in 07, ESPN came to me and they said, we think fantasy football is big enough that we need a guy. We're looking for our Mel Kuyper of fantasy football and we like all the work you d have done for us because I'd been doing Cold Pizza and ESPN News and some of those shows. And uh, they said, we want to buy your website, move you to Connecticut, and make you the guy. And that was in 07, and it was a two-year deal. And uh, wound up being a 15-year run there. How hard was it to leave? It had to have been after 15 years. It, it was. Had to have been. <clears throat> it, it certainly was. Missed the people. Um, uh, you know, loved the people. Loved my time. Wasn't look Honestly, wasn't looking to leave. Um, and, uh, you know, and they made me a, a, a three-year extension offer, very kind, a generous, really nice raise, but the opportunity at NBC was just too good to pass up, you know, to be able to do, to talk about fantasy football on Football Night in America, on the number one studio show in the world, like, it was just too good an opportunity to pass up, and I wanted to be a part of NFL coverage, uh, which wasn't a big part of what I did at ESPN, and so... I mean, that's really what it was. It wasn't like, you know, I left with I left with hugs and handshakes. I have nothing bad to say about my time at ESPN. So you're back on Sunday night now for the first time since Married with Children. Correct. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. How yeah. long did you work for that show? I did one year. I did 28 episodes on the show. How many writers were on the show? Probably eight or nine. That's just got to be a fascinating process. Just sit around and drink and eat. Oh, it was great. Eat and it, maybe smoke. Oh yeah, it was. It was Not, so much, maybe the Chris Sims substance just for inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Um, I never did that. Uh, I may, but some people may have contact. But, you know, yeah, exactly. There you go. But you know the, the the great. I mean, it was both awful and awesome. The awesome part about it is it's an amazing show, right? It, it's this iconic show. I joined towards the end, and I'd grown up, and that cast was so incredible. You could write a so-so joke. And Ed O'Neill would make it a home run, you know, or, or Christine Applegate or Katie Segal or, you know, David Faustino. Like, the cast was amazing. Uh, really gay. And, like, if you wrote him a good joke, you know, it was, it was a grand slam. And if you wrote him a so-so joke, they'd still sell it and make it work. So that was the great thing. And just it was so much fun to write for those characters. And it's Married with Children. So sort of everything went, right? You could do all sorts of stuff. The tough part was 
is that there was one guy on staff who'd been there the entire time. They did 259 episodes of the show. And so you'd like, you're sitting around in the writer's room and you're trying to pitch stuff. And you'd go, hey, um, uh, you know, what about, uh, so I got this idea. Okay, so Kelly and Bud do blah, 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 blah. And they'd go, ah, you know, there's this one time in season six that we sort of did that with Peg. You know, I mean, like literally every single thing. Like they did, they had done every episode. Because again, the show is those four people, that couch, and the shoe store. I mean, it really, you know, I mean, it was so, that was the brilliance of it, the simplicity of it, but it was also like, you had to really start thinking about, uh, okay, what about, nah, we kind of did that in season four. You're like, oh, you know, That's was, what amazes me about The Simpsons. Like, how in the hell do The Simpsons keep coming up with new stuff? Because oh, somewhere, yeah. you've got to have the connective tissue all the way back to the sure. beginning and awareness of everything you've ever done because you know that there are people out there watching the show who know. They okay. know, and they're going to call you out on it if you do contradict or overlap or it feels like you're being lazy, and you may as well just do a clip show if you're going to go back and, and rehash old storylines again. The executive producer of The Simpsons is a, is a friend of mine, a guy named Matt Selman, brilliant writer, really funny, and I've talked to him about that, and he says the same thing. He says, we, we actually have to reference other, like, you know, it's just like, I think, I think he was telling me a story, like, I think they did two different, two different episodes where, like a, like, a sugar truck or something broke down, and they had to, in the second, they were like, what are the odds of a sugar truck breaking down again? You know, like they have to, they constantly have to like sort of wink at the audience and, and acknowledge, you know, that yeah, it's going on. I mean, The Simpsons is one of the all-time amazing success stories. 32 years now and, yeah. and still going strong. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.